Got it. Indirectly creating wetlands because um, the, the, the government, mostly the federal government, does recognize their value. And so it spends a, a huge amount of money uh, making man-made wetlands. And uh, it would be a lot cheaper to just encourage beavers to make ones that are much more natural and more productive. So there's a lot of potential there, a lot of potential. This is that same site on the ground. Very common feature, you know, with the, the mowing going right up to the edge of the stream. And the, shifting on to the issue of beaver human conflicts, this is the way they're almost always handled. Um, and they have been historically. I, I mean, it's, it's I'll, I'll, I, I hinted at this before, but it's, you know, high quality, effective high quality flow devices are a pretty new phenomenon. And so we haven't had much choice uh, over the decades than to just uh, rely on killing beavers, um, which is just a guarantee you'll never solve the problem. Absolute guarantee because uh, the beavers that are killed are never the last beavers, uh, which is a good thing, but it just means that the, you know, after cleaning the culvert, you go away, you leave a naked culvert, and uh, it'll be clogged by the first beaver that, that, that comes along. So it's a very, very inefficient um, way to approach the problem. And uh, so that's why I talk, you know, we, we humans, uh, a large uh, um, important variable of our habitats are, is our financial habitats. So this, you know, to stop this process uh, saves a lot of money and definitely improves our, ha our habitats in that respect. So culverts, I often describe as beaver magnets. Beavers are, are economists and, and uh, they don't wanna have to build a great long uh, dam if they don't have to. And so they really like uh, you know, narrow outlets and bedrock or even, even better road culverts. They're just ideal that the dam is a, it's a massive man-made dam that's already in place with a little tiny hole in it. So that alone guarantees that it'll always be clogged. Um, and then in addition, when we rely on a lethal uh, defense strategy, we're also creating a, a, an unoccupied uh, territory. And so beavers are great explorers of the landscape. And when they're, when they're searching the landscape, they're often as territory animals looking for uh, high quality habitats, which is, you know, the damming site alone can, can make a, a, a habitat of a high quality. And so every culvert site essentially is a high quality habitat. And they're also looking for unoccupied habitats. So we've, we create a double magnet with that, with that uh, approach to the problem. Uh, this is a, yeah, this is, this is quite a story here. This is in Vermont. You see, it's a railroad culvert and they just, uh, refuse to protect this culvert. And for decades, I've been watching them, they parked the, these, these uh, cars there and they'll, they'll have to move the, the whole cars to get a, and then they bring an excavator down on a flatbed, bring the excavator down the side of the bank and to clear the beaver dam out. And then they have the beavers killed and then they put the cars back and go away and, and uh, you know, rinse and repeat the cycle. So it goes, it's been going on for decades and decades, you know, at the, cost of tens of thousands of dollars. So I, I really began my professional flow device. That's a, a general term I use for these things. And uh, beaver deceiver is a term I coined in 1995. And I'm the only person who builds authentic beaver deceivers, even though it's a very popular term that's used by a lot of people. But I began my, my career um, after I got out of UMaine and got a job with the Penobscot Nation. And they have a, a, a you know, about 150,000 acres of wonderful land across the, across the northern and central Maine and a lot of great beaver habitat. And they had a lot of clogged culverts and washed out roads. And uh, so me and my friend, uh, Nick Sapiel, went to work building uh, what we thought were good flow devices, but uh, like so many people, we, we didn't know. We didn't know what was required. And so things like this of this scale have no chance of working. Um, and uh, it would have been very easy to give up in that first year. Um, but I've been at it now for 
for uh, 25 and and uh, or more, <laughs> and and I'm still very challenged today. It's a very very big challenge. And so my my first uh, sort of invention, if you will, was a trapezoidal fence, and this is what it looked like. This is the first attempt at a trapezoidal fence. <laughs> I, I built this awful little fence on a culvert, and it, it was just too small, had no chance. And so I said, well, maybe I'll put a wing out there and that'll help. And so that was sort of the, the whole idea was, you know, if you can create an angle that's sort of an unnatural direction for a beaver dam. And uh, that was a good concept for its time, but they had to be built very big like this because you, you still were attached to the, uh, to the dam, essentially, to the, uh, to the bank. And so the beavers would start damming the corners here and, you know, even, even on a big trapezoid, and it would eventually, eventually go around. So it's, it's not as uh, secure as something with a pipe system, which I came to, I, I use now, and I, I developed soon after this. Another, another trapezoid in Massachusetts. And uh, this was down in Stockton Springs. This is my daughter. She's almost 30 now. So I've been, I've been at this uh, for a while. And this is not me. This is one of the problems with being passionate, enthusiastic about something. And so when I was at the tribe, I, you know, I published a lot about our work, you know, and, and talked about the trapezoid. And, you know, and then a few years after that, I stopped using trapezoids because I, I, and you'll see, I, I came to stuff that was much better, much better. But people, people are still out here putting these little trapezoids out all over the place. They have no chance of working. There's nothing, nothing magical about a trapezoid. Um, so that's a little discouraging. But the thing about low quality flow devices like this and uh, people you know, not appreciating how much of a challenge this is, um, is that they, they all fail. And then people come to the conclusion that, that all flow devices cannot work. Beavers are way too smart. And then they just double down on killing. So instead of progressing, um, we're, we're, we can actually lose ground if we don't do it well. Here's another little trapezoid I found out in my travels. Just had no chance whatsoever, of course. And then there's a lot of things like this, you see. Um, and uh, so this, obviously the beavers would just uh, clog this. And so this is totally dependent on the beavers always being killed. In fact, any any low quality flow device doesn't. It's going to end up, you know, the beavers are going to have to be killed. So you haven't really gained anything in terms of ecological and hydrological values. In addition to spiritual and aesthetic values that come with beavers and and the wetlands they create and and the array of of other species that use them. And then if you get a, a big flow here, even without beavers in the picture that, you know, the, the culverts are going to be at only half, if that, capacity because of all the debris that will get caught on the grates. So um, not too long after I was building um, the trapezoidal beaver deceivers, I built this thing called the round fence. And that's a, what I generally call a filter that goes on the end of a pipe. And so there you have a, a relatively good filter on a pipe and all of a sudden you have a what's called a pipe system. And uh, we named these pipe systems caster masters. Uh, that name has not really taken off. Other people have, have used this uh, technique and, and so renamed, renamed it. And so a common name is uh, that you, you'll see out there is a pond leveler. Um, but it's it's the same concept with this upright enclosed cylinder of mesh for the uh, filter, and so the fil with a filter you're trying to filter beavers out and filter or sneak water in. Um, so beavers are not very smart. I have to say that because people often ask me how do these things work, and I say well the first thing you have to understand is that beavers do not they don't have a brain that works like our brains. And, you know, we're really good at problem solving and we, we almost always will step back and look at the big picture and then uh, deductive reasoning will kick in. 
but the beavers are very uh, 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 myopic and they're, they're just responding primarily to environmental stimuli, the sound, the feel, and the look of leaks. And so if the idea of a filter on the end of a pipe, for, well, two things, a long pipe actually creates a permanent leak and it moves that leak well up, upstream from the dam where the beavers expect to link the leak. So that's helpful, just a long pipe. But uh, you also have to have a very good filter because you're trying to keep the beavers away from the fast moving molecules that, that are entering the pipe. So you want the, the molecules to enter around the, en the, uh, the perimeter of that filter very slowly and hopefully not stimulate damming behavior. Is it, and you can use that, that previous picture was a polyethylene, say call it soft plastic pipe, or you can use PVC like this one, uh, which is in a beaver dam. The rock is just to, to hold it down because the pipe's a little buoyant. And you notice it's, it's um, this, you, we're going through the whole evolution of the beaver deceiver, but in the early days, I used brown. You see the fencing is brown, it has no coating on it. So that's, it's raw steel which will dissolve very quickly in acidic water. So here's a, here's a next generation uh, round fence filter with epoxy coated wire, or, or a, which gives it a green look. And then there's these, these, uh, these um, models that were sort of intermediary where I was still using a trapezoidal shape, but combining it with pipe systems. This is in Virginia. There's no real need for a trapezoid there. Once you have a good pipe system, the, the shape and, and the size of the fence, the initial fence on the culvert uh, becomes less important. And I, I, I will call those fences now receiver fences because they're almost always receiving pipe systems and they prevent, um, they keep the beavers away from the, the downstream end of the pipes, but they also prevent the beavers from directly clogging the road culvert. And in a case like this, this is a good example of it. So the beavers uh, can never raise the water up here because of the pipe systems. They'll try to dam, you know, they'll, they'll always try to dam here first in these corners around the fence, but they're very vulnerable. You see, um, pooled water is escape habitat for beavers. So if they can't cr quickly create a pool of water, they just won't hang out there. They're very vulnerable to predators. And so this, a site like this with, with no water, no pool, It'll never ever be a, a challenge by beavers at all. And I must say, uh, every site's different, especially every culvert site. So you'll notice as we go through that every, I mold the flow devices to fit to the uh, topography and the other, other qualities of, of any given site. Another uh, intermediary model, it's up on um, uh, Maliseet land in Northern Maine. And this is a, a Penobscot uh, site in Northern Maine. And that is a whirlpool, <laughs> which develops at the end of the, end of the pipe sometimes, it's, particularly if you have a pressure differential. If you have high flows and say a too small pipe, then you're gonna get a whirlpool. And that makes a sucking sound. It has a, a, a visual signature too. So when that happens, that just tells beavers there's a leak there and they will bury it. So I've had to, I start, this is a, this is a, my, one of my earlier attempts um, at a whirlpool break. So when the, the whirlpool is created, it hits the underside of the plywood and the energy dissipates and it doesn't reach the surface. And that's, that's my son, Forrest, a long time ago. He's a taller than, bigger than I am now. And this is another, another uh, intermediate design where I was just trying to figure out the first square fence. So all my filters now are square fences. Um, and you can see that the receiver fence is also square, um, but you don't, with a square fence, I can build them much larger. It's easier to um, build in whirlpool breaks. And then there's another, another issue. You see that oftentimes I'll use six by six inch mesh fencing and small beavers can pull debris right through those holes. So I, I counter that by putting additional walls of fencing inside the filter 
just to, to kind of ruin the damming habitat inside, if you will. And I call those misery multipliers. And uh, I, there aren't any on this model. I just showed just because this is simple. This is very crude. This is, you know, I did, I had no idea how to build a good square fence. It just takes even simple things. And they look very simple now that, now that I'm done, but man, they even simple things. And when it's original thinking, boy, it takes a long time to, to get them good. And here's a, here's a uh, two square fences that were built at different time periods. The one on the left is just a, uh, that's sort of a design I've, I've abandoned. It doesn't have the, the wooden frame and the one on the right is more, more modern. So in, in addition to fooling beavers, you're, you're building things in a very, very harsh environment. I've, I've already mentioned the acidic water, but you also have to um, have things that resist um, decay processes, um, which is why I almost always use pressure treated wood when it's, when it's above the water and floods and, and ice. So they have to be really, really rugged. Here's a underwater uh, square fence with a very small whirlpool break. Um, today's whirlpool breaks are much larger than that. And uh, see how big that filter is? That's uh, about 10 feet on, on each side. So much, much bigger than you can build a round fence or a, or a, a circular filter. And then it, just a site, a site that is a Y shaped, you know? So this is how you have to, you have to be able to adapt to every site because one, one pipe system, and one filter would not have been adequate in that, in that location. Sarah, do we have any questions as we, as we come up yet? Um, well, first of all, you, there's a few books that people have recommended uh, that, that highlight your work. And so uh, one of them is Eager by Ben uh, Goldfarb. And so, and then Liza Hall wrote about the uh, one that's great for younger kids, um, Radical Rodents Ecosystem Engineers. I'm not sure what that's the title, but at any rate, um, so that you're, you're famous in that regard too. Um, and then in terms of specific questions, there was a question earlier from Ken about um, how beavers, um, were they a problem for indigenous people or what was the relationship and, yes. and you know, why was that the case? So I'm yeah, curious great, about that. Great question. Great question. I mean, think of, think of us, us moderns, and that includes the tribes now too, you know, we, we almost always just think of beavers as a pest, you know, that threatens our properties. Well, that's mostly because of roads and, you know, the, uh, yeah, the, the tribes did not have roads like that, you know, so it was a non-issue. I think it was an absolute non-issue. And it was all positive, all positive, you know, because they, th these wetlands produce so much food, including the beavers themselves um, for the native peoples. Um, and they didn't, they didn't seem to, I think they did use the beavers a lot, but they didn't seem to over exploit them until the fur trade came along and they became, you know, sort of uh, partners in the fur trade. But I, I, it seems as though the beavers were extremely uh, numerous when Europeans arrived, um, which would suggest that, uh, you know, they, were, they weren't being over, overused. Great. So I don't see any other questions yet. So feel free to continue. And if, if right. people are thinking about questions having to do with the, what we're talking about, just yeah. let us know. Yep, we'll do. We'll do. So I, yeah, anyways, you'll see that a little black on the, uh, okay, this is six inch mesh, but I've staggered it because another thing that can happen with six inch mesh, it's very, there's very, very big problems associated with it, is that um, large beavers can try to force their way through and get stuck. And so if it's a busy road, I, I will sometimes stagger the fencing so they can't, they can't go through and then they, they can walk over the road. I, I, when, if it's a very busy road, I'll, I'll often build in what I call beaver or turtle doors. Um, it's, it's, you know, most smaller animals say uh, muskrat and, and uh, 
otter can go through the fencing, but the two animals that, that have a hard time are large beavers and large snapping turtles. And so it's a, you, know, you have to consider that at every site. Skip, another question has come up about um, a Canadian model. And do you want to just um, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask that? Yes. Um, okay, so I remember seeing something um, about a Canadian model where I think they were doing something like a second culvert. Um, and I guess the one culvert was for the beavers and the other culvert was somehow protected so that they couldn't, you know, um, you know, block it up. I can't remember exactly what they were doing, but I don't remember any kind of a filter. Um, are you familiar with what they're doing up there? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what you're what you're describing. Um, if you're just talking about a second road culvert. Yeah, like, it seems like they were doing something like that. Yeah, yeah I know that. That's a that's a great opportunity. No, <clears throat> excuse me. We frequently will have you know two or three culverts side by side, and particularly in big watersheds. And I always like to try to leave one open for the animal movement. Uh -huh. um, but you have to protect the other ones. Yeah, you have to. But, well, they were. This was specifically done to. It was kind of like one of them was a sacrifice. And and yeah. it was like a fooler kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then the other one, but you know beavers way better than I do, of course. But but it seems to me that they were somehow fooling the beavers into using one culvert. Yeah. And yeah. and then the other one somehow yeah. they had it higher or a side thing or something. Yeah, it's been yeah. a while since I saw it, and um, you know, then they that one was clear. Yeah, well, it won't be clear. But I mean, if, if, the, if the goal is simply to create a, a tunnel for wildlife to pass through, that, that's fine. But uh, and if you, if you do have it higher than the other ones, then it won't have water in it and the beavers won't clog it. So that's a right. great example. But if it's down in the water, the beavers are going to clog it and, and it's, it's not going to be used. It's going to have to be protected because they will always clog them. So, okay. But but in terms of other flow devices, you know I'm I'm familiar with everything, and what I do is is I I want to I want to do anything else, put it that way, and what I do is the bare minimum that has any chance of of uh, succeeding, and in in the long term presence of beavers, um, and and while requiring very little maintenance and no killing. So that's that's uh, my the thresholds that I go for. Um, a lot of flow devices you'll see out there that don't have a chance. They may look like they're working, but it's only because they're killing the beavers, and the and the, the flow device isn't being challenged. I just point out you, you see a little black on the uh, on the spot welds the the joints of the mesh, and that's the, they don't do a good job at the factory of getting those with the epoxy. So I spray every single one of those by hand. And it's just very important because my feeling is if you don't build these things to last, you just you're kind of wasting your money. And uh, so the, the the acidity is really a big challenge, represents a big challenge. Just another site. Not long after I, I built this one, and you know it's 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 problematic to to stagger the fencing because especially this is a very big watershed. So I'm I kind of want to. Uh, keep the keep the mesh coarse, keep the filter coarse, and so I I decided not to stagger this. And no sooner had I uh, finished, and a beaver got stuck right here, <laughs> so I came back and staggered the fencing. But it um, that's a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges associated with this if you're going to do it right. Um, so I always encourage people that you know if they can do it, save your money and hire hire my company. Um, um, but uh, you saw how I started out too. I started out struggling and failing for many years. But the thing is, I, did, I just, because of my passion for, you know, in knowing that the only other option was to kill beavers and therefore drain wetlands, you know, I just, I just refused to, to give up. It's just too, too important an issue, but not, not many people have that luxury, I suppose. 
Yep, we did have a question about um, the cost. Um, Mary's saying, you know, what does it cost if you're yeah. making yeah. your basic 10 foot square with two pipes at a road, road yeah. culvert? What's no, it's, it's hard to say, <laughs> but I will anyway, because every site's different. And, you know, sometimes I travel to Alaska to do one or Eastern Maine or, you know, so there's a lot of variables. And, and one, of the, one of the variables that affects costs is the size of the watershed. The bigger the watershed, you know, the bigger the, the device has to be and the more expensive it is. And then you have to keep in mind that inflation is running rampant, you know, so my prices have pretty much doubled or not, not quite doubled, but in the last year, year and a half, just to keep up with the material costs, the steel and the plastic pipes are just out of, out of control. Having said that, yeah, for, for decades, I, I was just I was saying around 2,500, which is way too cheap. It's always been too cheap. And now I'm saying oftentimes around 3,500. Um, and and uh, yeah, it's, I, I don't make enough on it. I, I, um, and what I, what I say, particularly when you consider what I, what I save people, I mean, every one, every one of these will save tens of thousands very quickly in the absence of constantly cleaning the culvert and repairing damaged roads and killing beavers. And then you have sites like this, which is in um, Monroe, Maine, where you have an upstream beaver dam. This is very common that if you just keep the beavers alive, it, the culvert is really the only problem. And beavers in the general vicinity, the, you know, their wetlands aren't threatening anything. And so you can, you know, the beaver deceiver is, is responsible for protecting this wetland, assuming nobody goes in there and kills the beavers anyway. And so this, this is the most exciting kind of site. And there's so many around and they're, they're there, they're out there in every town where you can very cheaply create a, a million dollar wetland. And, and at the same time, you know, sa save a lot of money in, in uh, road maintenance and repair culvert maintenance. So I hope that answered the question. <laughs> What you yeah, should be think, how great. much how much do we earn? How much does our investment create? Because uh, yeah, yeah I, I think you're right that the value of the wetland to the community and the people who own that property and so forth is yeah. is a part of the equation. Tremendous. But, but this, and you know, I always say ecological and hydrological, both huge categories. But I mean, on my own property, where we where the original beaver receiver was built, and as a result. That was 50 years ago. 50 years, the town has not spent one penny on that culvert. And, and these beautiful wetlands have developed everywhere. And people are constantly stopping down there because it's a roadside wetland just like this, constantly stopping to look at wildlife. It has enormous um, aesthetic and spiritual value for a community and for individuals, just enormous. They're the most fascinating places in the landscape and the best places for them for, you know, is, is beside roads where people can enjoy them. And, uh, and then, you know, I always, I always, I usually emphasize just a wild, incredible wildlife habitats that they are, but, but the hydrological values are great too. I mean, these are the greatest sediment sinks, you know, in the world. And so, and which is why trees and, and sometimes crops have been grown on them because um, and cattle, cattle and sheep grazed on them, you know, between the, before the beavers recovered them from the fur trade, because oftentimes it's meters of fine soils that have been captured by the beaver dams over, over, uh, you know, thousands of years. And so it, it really helps to, you know, they, they, they sequester, uh, you know, excess nutrients and pollutants and, and, uh, just, just really, and, and they act as sponges. You know, when you have a large scale flood, these wetlands will absorb and hold a lot of water and then release it slowly over time, thereby reducing those peak flows downstream, which cause all the damage uh, to people's properties. So just, it, but, you know, so all, the, the values are just almost endless, but we just, as a society, we're not good at acknowledging that or recognizing that. We just see it almost almost always. We just see a, a past, a threat that needs to be destroyed, and so we got to get a little bit better at being sports. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. So this is a, another site where the beavers are never going to be able to bring the water up here. 
So that's, this is, you know, this is never going to be a problem. And plus, when you have a dam just upstream, that will, you know, the beavers will, will get what they need from that, and their focus will be more upstream. So I often will build what I call starter dams just upstream to get the beavers started on a dam and to create a, help, help create a wetland. I'll show you some pictures of those. So I, this is a series of pictures where I'm just, I'm, I'm making that point that if you can just stop killing the beavers, you're going to protect or create some great wetlands. This is on the Penobscot Nation, and you can see where the road crosses up here. So the beaver, this is a 50 acre wetland up here, 50 acres and another, you know, 20 at least in here. And the beavers were living up here and moving down here. That, that's a dam. That's a dam. They're moving down here and clogging the culvert. So if you don't protect that non-lethally, you're going to drain, you know, 50 to 70 acres of wetlands, ultimately, fairly quickly. You're going to drain them, you know, because they're dependent on one family of beavers. Um, so not, not acceptable. And this is another site there in Alton, Maine, at the, on the Penobscot land. Just upstream from this uh, beaver deceiver is a, a, about an 80-acre beaver flowage. And because, again, it's very flat here, perfectly flat. So tremendous flowage. It's, and the beavers, again, were moving from up there down and clogging this culvert. One family, the dam is about a third of a mile long. One family of beavers is, is built and maintained that entire dam. Just a, a miracle. Every time I, I go up there, it's just full of ducks. You, you often see moose and bald eagles. Just an amazing, amazing value. And this is in down east Maine. And you can see the beaver dam right here, you know, just above the flow device right there. It's responsible for this massive wetland. If you don't protect this non-lethally, again, you don't have that wetland. Or, or if it's, you know, a few years ago, you, it, it won't have the chance to develop. Uh, it's not just losing them. It's, 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 it's oftentimes just arresting that process of creating them that beavers are still engaged in as they as they're recovering from the fur trade. And there's an, another one, this is in New York State, a beaver dam right there. So you see this straight line? <laughs> this is what, what we did last century everywhere. We just went down and dredged canals down through all the wetlands. First we killed the beavers and we got them real dry, but that wasn't enough. So we, we came and we dredged channels down through the wetlands. You see this all over the place in the most rural places. You know, wetlands, we've always been at war with wetlands. And uh, so the beavers, the recovery of beavers, and, and uh, you know, it allows us an opportunity to restore these, you know, all these systems almost for free, almost for free, because uh, the, the, you do have to buy a few flow devices. Again, another wonderful upstream beaver dam. This is in New Hampshire. Just a, these are the greatest sites. It's so gratifying. This is another one in New Hampshire. Um, that, that upstream beaver dam, it's not going to persist without beavers. And this is just a beautiful wetland um, in uh, uh, Stonington, Maine, owned by the Richards family. Carol Richards, I, I've worked for, for since the uh, 1990s. And it's right on the coast. And, the, you know, the bald, just as one example, the, the bald eagles will come in a lot often and land on that rock um, just to get a, a drink of fresh water. So I'm very, you know, freshwater wetland next to the ocean is really valuable, valuable for a lot of migrating birds. And, uh, you know, without beavers, the, the, the wetland vegetation here would be far thicker and almost a mon monoculture, but they'll, they break it up, they're, eat, they're feeding on it. And so that is actually much more natural and uh, benefits a lot of, a lot of species. They, they love water lilies. So beavers, they don't just eat trees. And so in a site like this, that's the, that the aquatic vegetation is incredibly important to them. Wow, look at this. This is uh, at Fort Dix too. You see that beaver chew right here? See how the, the culvert's down here, right? Beavers can't climb trees. So this was, there's a big road behind us that was totally clogged and the water was up at that level, which allowed the beavers to, to chew that branch off. So that's, you know, imagine what that costs to clean that out once that happens and how much property is possibly damaged upstream. 
Um, yeah, that's so just you avoid one one event like that, you've saved, you know, a, a huge amount of money. And I try to build these devices to last, you know, maybe 50 years, I really build them well. So they'll pay for themselves many, many times over again. This is a, another a firing range at Fort Dix. Um, you see this uh, culvert to the left, you see how brown it is. See, th that was because there was a huge beaver dam in that culvert and the water level was up here. And that's what acidic water does to raw steel or galvanized steel. The galvanization makes no difference. So don't um, replace your old steel culverts with new steel culverts, use plastic. And this is um, a very tight spot. So no matter how much or how little room I have to work, I can make something work. Another uh, wet New Hampshire, beautiful New Hampshire wetland. And the cattail, beavers are great at knocking the hell out of cattail. Cattail monocultures, they're, they're, they're this, open them up for the ducks and really, really improve things. And it's not just road culverts. There's also what I call regular beaver dams. So this is just an example of a, of a pipe system. You just, it's, it's basically the same thing without the receiver fence. And I did, I did put, put a little fence right here, just sort of keep the beavers away for a little bit from the downstream end of that pipe. And we're getting near the end, folks. So this is a this is a exciting story. This is in Marlboro, Vermont, and so this this is a a a wetland that was occupied early on in the recovery process by beavers because there's no standing dead timber. It's all already fallen over. It would have been all standing dead timber. They probably dammed here, say 1930. And so it's had, it's had decades to fall over. So there weren't no, no real habitat features, structural features like you get in most flowages until the dam, until the lodge was built. Okay. No, there's no perch trees. There's no perch trees in that, in that wetland until the lodge was, was built. You don't think a lodge is as important perch, um, uh, perches for birds, but they, they started using it immediately, you know, uh, tree swallows and oops, that's out of order. Sorry. That's a nice wetland and well, near you guys down in Bremen. Yep. Jeff and Diantha Robinson. This is a, and I'll go back to the, the story of the perch, the perch lodge, but uh, yeah, this, so that, that, that is the second filter I built here, I think. Anyway, the first one was built over here somewhere to the right, and it was a round fence, and there was no whirlpool break, and the beavers, you know, just buried it. They learned that that was a place to dam. So then I, then then I, made things more difficult difficult for myself, and uh, fortunately, the the people that live around this uh, stuck with me and allowed me to just keep making it better. You don't have to just because you have a failure doesn't mean you have to quit, and I'll never quit as long as my clients don't. And so you can just make it better, even though the beavers have sort of been taught to how to how to defeat these things. You can still win by just making a bigger, uh, higher quality square fence filter. Okay, here we go. Red winged blackbird and robin. Isn't that a great photo? Oh, I love that. A kingfisher, a kingfisher, kingbird with a dragonfly. And then I come back the next spring and a goose is nesting on that lodge. So this is one beaver, probably was there one month and built the lodge. And you, you see the, you know, just a few, the few benefits that I was able to record with my camera. It's just a miracle, miraculous. Here's a site um, where I'm trying to create a, trying to get the beavers to dam. I call it a starter dam. And this is a culvert that you know, has never been protected. And just recently they had been cleaning it out with a backhoe. So there, there's a, the, the, the uh, beaver deceiver and the starter dam in place. I still have to add a pipe system to this because if the dam got too tall, 
then it would, it would affect the road. But I'm baiting the beavers here. You see, I have aspen in here. I want the beavers to come down there and, and, uh, and, and focus their efforts on that site. And so here, here's, a, again, a lot of bait. The dam's getting bigger here. Wonderful wetland being created. And that's, that's the pipe system associated with this. And then there it is as a, a site with, with a dam. How You can see how big it is now. That's the starter dam way down there and uh, the pipe system there that goes out to here. And uh, there's three, three beaver dam, uh, lodges right in that photo. So a lot, of, a lot of ecological value. And I decked this, right? You saw the picture just a couple slides ago of the a small decked receiver fence. And I decked this one too. And I did it because it's, these are now fire ponds. They're roadside fire ponds. So the firefighters can get down on the deck, stick the hose in the pond and fill up their tank. So here's another starter dam. This is gonna become a magnificent wetland probably this year. Another example, you know, some people use the term uh, beaver dam analog. These things, I've been doing it long before that term, but these things uh, do not have to look anything like a beaver dam. They just have to, you know, provide a little structure, get the beaver started. So that's why I like that, my term better. Look at, look at the change that goes on here. Look at that dam. Uh, it doesn't take much to get beavers to dam where you want them. It's a little bit harder to get them to not dam where you want them not to. But, and that's a, this is a very difficult culvert to protect because it was just a tiny little mud hole there. And so again, having that starter dam out front takes, takes the beavers a focus off the, the, the beaver deceiver down here. It's very helpful. And then, uh, you know, a few words about fish. I've, I can, you can always build fish ladders. Probably the best way to permanently get fish through a beaver dam is with a flow device. Um, and so in, in other, you know, the other options aren't, aren't good, uh, particularly extirpating this native keystone species. If, you know, if, killing, if you're just killing all the beavers to try to get fish upstream, I think you're, there's a problem with that approach. Um, it can be done non-lethally and in a much longer term manner because the other option is to have somebody go and breach the dams every day um, while the fish are running. There's another, this is just, this is just a little fish ladder on, I, this is a, a stream right near my house. It I know it has brook trout in it, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to create a barrier to them. And then just a couple other issues. Occasionally the beavers will dig underneath the road because they're great diggers and they dig into banks. And this is a, the, the cavern where the cavern was where, they, um, where the roof fell in. But that's very, very easy to stop that. They always dam just below the water surface. So it's a very predictable zone, damming, or not damming, dig. Very predictable digging zone that you can, you can block. And then the other issue, which is, you know, both of these latter issues are much less significant than the damming issue, which is, um, you know, just the big ticket item. And, and very, you know, as I said, it requires a great deal of knowledge and sophistication to successfully build flow devices, but anybody can protect a tree from being chewed. So this is what a, a good, a good uh, chew guard looks like. Doesn't have to be very fine mesh, but if you use it, say the six inch mesh, which you find in the, used in the concrete industry, then uh, you have to have a, a, a space between the tree um, because the beavers will stick their heads through those six inch squares and take a bite otherwise. So I'd be glad to help any of you over there in Maine, uh, if you need help, I'm over there every year and uh, my my website is beaverdeceivers.com with all my contact information. And I'd be glad to ask answer any questions and talk as long as you want to talk about this fascinating subject. That's great, Skip. Your your photographs are really helpful to really get a sense of the diversity of kinds of projects and sizes and situations. Yeah. It's really nice. Um, there is a question from Anne about she's um asking about, she knows about something called a beaver cone that she thinks that Canadians have been using. Is that something that you're familiar with? And, and what do you yeah. know about it? 
I hate to be unkind. <laughs> There's just so much junk out there. I just hope you guys got a sense of the sophistication and sort of the size, it, you know, that's required to sneak water away from beavers. You know, again, what I'm doing is the bare minimum. I've had I've had some problems with some of these really good flow devices or beaver deceivers that you've seen. So yeah, this I don't I I don't know this little little cones, little fences, little uh, T shaped culverts. I mean, none, none of it has a chance, quite frankly. Sorry. So, so <laughs> I have, I have Skip, a couple. So what I saw, sorry, is is you actually weld it onto the culvert. Yeah, I, 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 I've, I've seen them. Yeah, and yeah. they don't work. I would never use it. Not, not, okay. not in a thousand years. <laughs> okay, okay. The trouble that, yeah, that, I mean, again, I said this earlier, but you know, bad flow devices are the greatest threat that for our, you know, for our agenda, mm -hmm. for our mission to try to, you know, create healthier ecosystems with more beavers. It's a real problem. It's a real problem. There's been thousands of failures in, in Maine alone. Uh -huh. so, it just, know. it seems like you're doing the least invasive thing. You know, I mean, the water flows through the, through the culvert just like it would. And then supposedly the the beavers cannot build a dam up against the culvert. With what I do, or with the cone? No, with the with the cone thing. Sorry, I don't mean to. Yeah, no, this to... a big dam around it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I wish you. <laughs> wish it was okay, simple. I don't mean to press the point. I'm pretty simple. <laughs> I'm pretty simple. I'm uh, I'm not exactly a road scholar, and I can do it. So I think we can do it as a society. You yeah. know, it's, it's 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 a big challenge, and you have to respect that. And you know, ho hopefully, people are you know more than willing to learn from me, and I can work with people, and, and you know, they can do their own thing and struggle for decades like I have, but I can save them a lot of time. But. Uh, um, you know, we, we have to do it. I, I, we just have to change our, our attitude. It's, it's, it's almost suicidal just to, you know, degrade our ecosystems and, ne and, and adopt an approach that guarantees you'll never solve a problem. I mean, the only thing that's going to solve the problem that way is if another fur trade happens. And God knows our, you know, the regulations are, would allow for it. They're, you know, wide open, unli unlimited harvest, six month seasons. So if, if the, only thing protecting the beavers is the low low international fur prices, um, but no, no, we, we 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 should be we should be able to do better. We should be able to solve problems and and have really really uh, rich productive ecosystems, and that that benefits you know trappers, it benefits hunters, it bene benefits uh, anglers, you know, it benefits people that you know just enjoy wildlife in a non consumptive <laughs> We all benefit, and, and we, we all benefit as taxpayers. We don't benefit as ta taxpayers by never, you know, taking an approach that guarantees we never actually solve the problem. <laughs> That's not a good thing, good way to approach things. Um, there's a couple questions, and I also want to read a comment. The first is the comment that's shared by Mark McCullough in our, in our chat. He wrote, Skip is too modest and hasn't mentioned it, but he dropped everything last July to build a complex of beaver devices on a nature conservancy property in Northern Maine to save the critically endangered Eastern Prairie fringed orchid that was flooded by beavers. The orchids and USFWS say, thank you, Skip. Oh gosh. I wanted to share that out loud with so Thanks, everybody Mark. here. And- Thanks, Skip. Uh, Mark, Mark has done a great work his entire career. And it's, it's a pleasure to, to work with him. Neat. Um, there's a question uh, from Stephen Huffnagel, our uh, Coastal Rivers Executive Director, and he's asking, how does the state of Maine measure up to other New England states or states beyond New England in terms of our beaver policy? Can you point to any standout towns in our region who have improved their approach? <laughs> you guys are just determined to get me in trouble, aren't you? <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't like it. I don't like I don't like the general approach of society. I'm, let's not pick on anybody. I think every every state's equally bad, you know. But but they they're bad because you know people like me haven't done a good enough job, I guess, you know, um, making effective flow devices, you know, and so with in the absence of that, you know, killing has been the only, only thing that we could do, we cannot have clogged culverts, period. Um, but it doesn't seem like, I mean, that's changed, we, we have a lot of contractors and a growing number of contractors that that, that can build good flow devices. And, uh, you know, we need to start exploiting them and, and like we like we're exploiting want to exploit the beavers you know so that's changed and uh, so we can do better and we need to start treating beavers like a keystone species and not just as a pest uh, and uh, so so I, I think Maine as well as every state can do better and you know they've done a good job uh, holding the line you know through regulations for a long time but we have to make some transitions we really have to and, and Skip, based on what you said at the beginning of this talk and also some things you said to me recently, um, it sounds like um, any community could be poised to make some real changes at some specific locations. And then yeah. uh, we could be a model for other places. Um, thank, you. Well, thank you for saying that, Sarah. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to mention that as well. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a minor, you know, I'll I'll come help you. I'm available, <laughs> and That's and great. it's you know because beavers occupy such a small percentage of the landscape, you only have a handful of chronic conflict points in any town. So I think as I told you on the phone, in in two weeks I could eliminate the beaver conflict for you for fifty years, <laughs> um, or or those those say six conflict points could 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 translate into hundreds of conflict points, you know, with a lethal um, policy that you're constantly having to return to. So. Um. Great. Um, and John um, has a question that he asks, what happens if you have a dam and the beavers add to the dam, uh, which we, they, John and his family, presumably have dismantled many times? Then you, I think you need a flow device, a or generically a pipe system. You need a pipe in that dam with a good filter on it, or, you know, I always tell people. I'm always, you know, I, I'm always talking people out of hiring me. I say I, I, I'll take a look at a site and I'll say I don't see any real threat to any really high valuable property here. Why don't you just relax and enjoy the the biggest wetland you can, can you can have, or if you if it's a a, a minor issue like say they're flooding a trail you just you build a boardwalk or you divert the trail into the uplands you know so you know if it's a if it's a septic tank that's flooding or something serious then then you gotta have a, you, you need a pipe in that dam yeah it sounds like um the good news is he has great habitat that attracts beavers so that's, that's exciting right I'd, I'd be glad to, you know, just come and evaluate habitats, talk, talk to anybody when I'm in Maine. That's the uh, best, best part of this is creating wetlands indirectly and seeing things get better. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, John continues by saying we're trying to maintain our concrete dam level. So I'm not sure what that is related to, but. Um, okay. Concrete that, dam, damming the, the, the overflow of the, yeah. Yeah, that needs to be protected with not just a pipe, but a, a receiver fence and a pipe. Excellent. There you go. There's your consultation right there. Yep. Uh, <laughs> that's great. Um, and Ken asks, are beaver dams active if they don't have mud on them? Hmm. <laughs> well, all beaver dams have some mud in them or on them, but I, I think I know what he means when they are, when they're being uh, actively maintained, they, there's a little bit of black, black mud in that top edge. And, uh, but I mean, over, over winter, of course, you have a lot of active beaver colonies, you know, the, where the dam's not being maintained because they don't dam when, when the pond is iced up. So 
it's an active dam, but it's not being maintained for a period of time. So, it's, but you know, that, that's that brings up another point. You know, when a beaver dam is being has been recently maintained, it's perfectly level because beavers are working at the surface of the water, responding to what I call spillover stimuli. And so a, a pool of water is, is, is level. So a dam is perfectly level. So when you get a, a big flood, the dam is more likely to sheet over, evenly over the entire dam and may not breach as readily. But if you happen to kill the beavers um, or they aren't there, the dam very quickly um, begins to decay and become uneven. And that's then, then when you have a big flood, the water is more likely to cut through the dam in a low spot in the dam as opposed to sheeting evenly over it. Excuse me. So yeah. something, something to consider. Because <laughs> that's another issue people talk about, about you know, beaver dams breaking and having a big, a big rush of water. Of course, the, the best way to prevent that, they're pretty predictable sites where that's a that's a threat. They're usually very, you know, big water bodies um, with a very short dam that gets gets quite high. And so the best way to to eliminate that threat is not by killing beavers, which may just make the dam more decrepit, but with a, again with a flow device. Right. Um, let's see. There was um, well, first of all, I should say that it's a, it's a little over time, so I want to just mention to folks that you are welcome to stay on, and we will continue chatting and answering questions. Um, but I also want to honor people's time and just say thank you for joining us. Uh, this recording for this program um, will be sent to all of you with a link, and so you are welcome to share this with your friends and neighbors, uh, and uh, and they can also become um, more aware about about beaver deceivers and and about skip's work so that's great um and let's see there was a, a question earlier about uh, coastal rivers properties where beavers might be observed without disturbing them so thanks leslie for asking that and there are a number of sites that our our staff chimed in on the chat uh, jim mentioned that little falls brook has beaver dams that's the site in bristol that's uh, available to folks but it really is only accessible in the winter time when you can when you can access that site um and then um i think it was jim also who mentioned that the john and peg sproul preserve in bristol is another place you might be able to observe observe beavers and stephen mentioned that Dodge Point, which is a property that we helped to acquire and where we're the current local co-managers, um, it's state owned, but it has had beavers over time. There are no beavers, stand up beavers there now or beaver lodges or dams there, but that we're working on acquisition of um, about 500 acres over the next few months uh, that is, uh, that is, uh, has lots of beavers and, and dam um, sites in Bristol as well. So that's all super exciting. I will say even um, Salt Bay Farm over on the Belvedere Road has had beavers in the past. And you can see places where the beavers have, um, <coughs> excuse me, in the past taken down some aspens. And I think they kind of ate themselves out of house and home at that site and moved back across the street into what now is the Chapman property. Um, and there is an old beaver lodge and dam on, on that side across on the other side of Belvedere Road as well. So I, I don't know if it's active currently. But. So thank you for these questions and we welcome additional ones. This has all been really great folks. Hey, Sarah. Yes. So my slides were, were screen uh, shots from uh, Google Earth. So Google Earth, uh, beaver flowages are really distinctive. They're really easy to easy to tell which ones are flowages, I guess, with a little practice. But that you know, you could fly around um, in Google Earth and check out beaver habitats and, and explore them in your area. That that's a great suggestion. What a fun activity to go check it out on Google Earth and then sort of do some field testing and, and see how accurate you are. My favorite pastime. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure it is. You know, winter, you're frozen. Really good to do in the winter. Yeah. Skip, um, can you tell us the website for your business? Because that was a question. Is it beaverdeceivers.com? That's it. Thanks.
Yep. Welcome. Great. If anybody else has questions, by all means, just um, at this point, unmute yourselves and speak right up if there's anything particular you want to know. Maybe people are getting hungry. It's close to dinner time. <laughs> Leslie, can I uh, ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Leslie. I have read that um, if you see a beaver lodge in the winter and it does not, and it has snow on top of it, that means the lodge is not active because if the beavers were in there, they would basically steam the, the snow off the top. Is that correct? Yeah, that's usually the case. Yeah. Yeah, I pass by the site near the 1812 farm in Bristol all the time that has an absolutely beautiful beaver lodge in the middle of a pond, but I don't yeah. think there's any beavers in there. Yeah, you really see it when it gets cold, it gets to be 20 below, you get some really cool things happen. I've seen, I've seen the, uh, the steam from the beavers just frozen all through the trees above, above lodges on, on that kind of weather, pretty neat. Have you seen beavers in the open in the winter out in the snow? Anything oh, yeah. Wrong? Yeah, yeah. If they can get out, you know, they're oftentimes very hungry. So they'll they'll get out and, and that's a they'll get out more during the daytime, too, when they're that when they're that hungry and that desperate. Yeah, they'll scoot to the yeah. edges of the ice. There has to be a weak spot in the ice. Yeah. yeah. Often on the east side of ponds because the afternoon sun might warm it up a little bit. Uh, hi, Sarah. Do you uh, can you hear me? I can see. Steve. Hi. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Good. Um, currently in uh, Damerstata on Bisky Road, the uh, department, main department of transportation, is uh, dealing with some culverts there, and it, it's because the beavers are trying to plug them. But uh, I was curious: is there a possibility of uh, picking one of those sites? For instance, and actually building the, the uh, flow device as an there. example. That's yeah, it. and Skip knows that site particularly well, so he can talk about his history there. But yes, Steve, that's something that um, when we have a new town manager in April, um, I was specifically going to talk to them about. Go ahead, Skip. Yeah, no, okay. I, I, I protected that maybe for 15 years. Um, and so there, there was a, a beaver deceiver on it, and then they, they just took it out when they put the new culvert in, and it's just, it's just uh, pretty common. They didn't, didn't think that they need need to protect it again. Um, well, I, was the assumption I think, you know, just kill the beavers. You can always just kill the beavers, and but you can, but then you sterilize you either sterilize your ecosystem or you you don't um, effectively protect your culvert or, or both. So yeah, I'd love to I'd love to protect that culvert. And it, it needs to be protected. So hopefully uh, we can get something going. But you, you local people could probably make it happen better than I could. But I'll, I'd be glad to talk to anybody at DOT. We're, we're in on that for sure. We'd, we'd love to support that. And we've had great working relationship with the town and so many other things. Here's a chance to um, really make a difference in a particular spot that's quite visible. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks. 